Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Thank you for joining us. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful and grateful for your word and the time that you've given us to just come together and feast together on your word. I ask that the Holy Spirit filter out all of the foolishness, all of that which is not of you, but just seal to our hearts the truth of your word that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. We've been going through the second epistle to the Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last uh, study together, we were in our uh, the 11th chapter. We're uh, at about the 15th verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15. I pointed out uh, to you folks that at the writing of this epistle to Corinth and uh, during Paul's ministry at Corinth, God had not yet completed His Word. In fact, we have the testimony of the Holy Spirit that God had singled out Paul to complete the Word of God as He declares in the book of Colossians and and that had not yet been done so that in this context I asked you to consider that Paul is being used by the Holy Spirit in presenting the Word of God and that we're not studying together some idle boast on uh, the part of the Apostle Paul nor are we studying some attempt for him to exalt himself but rather we are looking at what the Holy Spirit has to say, not what Paul has to say. One of the thoughts that has occupied our time at the end of this epistle is not only a practical outworking of the exercise of God's grace, but also a careful examination as to the accuracy and the authority of that work that it might in fact be in agreement with the Word of God. And the presentation of the 11th chapter so far has been to show the credentials of the Word and show Paul's credentials. Paul wrote what he was told to write and what we see here is the Spirit's ministry in Corinth and the lesson for us is of course handling the Word of God very carefully and handling His Word correctly. It shouldn't surprise us at all, really, that the Holy Spirit is forcing us to look at the ministry of an ind individual. We are commanded not to judge people, but we are surely commanded to judge what is taught. We are to carefully examine the presentation of truth, holding fast to that which is good and despising that which is evil, and in every presentation of the Word of God, there is some mixture of that. You know, for we have this treasure in earthen vessels in order that the excellency of the power might be of God, not of ourselves. The final caution here is that even though someone preaches the same Jesus, it may be a different gospel and a different spirit. We were told as the paragraph ended, we were asked not to be surprised at this. You know, for as far as the believer in Christ is concerned, Satan's activity is arraying his messengers as messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, folks, it would be very, very difficult for any, any one of you to, uh, to be deceived by uh, someone preaching some other God. I mean, you people simply wouldn't tolerate it. The preaching must be on Jesus. There are those who skillfully present a different gospel and a different spirit using the same Jesus. And the way that our paragraph ended is that this is Satan's activity within the church among believers. People who have the idea that 
that Satan is the ruler of hell and that he wants God's people there is just not true. He is, in fact, the chief victim of hell, and I don't believe in any way that it's his purpose to put you in hell. He wants you to doubt God, to not rest in the promises of God, to belittle God, to exalt yourself instead of God, or that he can trap you into believing in a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel, a, a different good news. Therefore, his messengers are arrayed as apostles of Christ, ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is where his primary activity is when, as it concerns you and I. Verse 15, it is no great thing if his ministers also are transformed. That is made up. That's not an inner transformation. That's an outward makeup as an actor, you know, in a play. His ministers are made up as ministers of the righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. And that's where we left off last week. I'd like to take just a, just a moment to make a, a few comments. This ministry has been around now for nearly seven years, and I'm sure we have our, our same onslaught of problems that any other group of believers do. I don't think we're you know, anything special. I think we're highly typical of the believers at Corinth with some degree of carnality and some degree of pride. I praise the Lord for every one of you. You know, with extreme difficulty, I've learned to love you, though it may not appear at times that I do. I'm fairly positive that, to some degree, that's true the other way around. I love you in the Lord. I think you're a super group of people, and I can hardly wait to meet you. I want to simply tell you that the burden of this ministry has been, always been, always will be, that you would be reminded constantly of the seriousness involved in our studying and preaching the Word. The predominant theme is this book, its authority and its accuracy. It is my constant, sincere desire, my prayer. In fact, it is my prayer that from these studies you are able to make your own decisions. If the Lord should lead you elsewhere, this ministry will certainly not take a stand against it. But someplace we have to draw the line. It is not the function of this ministry to tell you folks which, which groups are good and which are bad, you know, which movies you can or shouldn't, can, cannot watch, should not watch, or what percentage of alcohol content that you can have in your drink, or, or anything like that. You know, or, or how you should be doing or not doing anything. That is preaching law, not grace. You don't want that. This ministry does not want that. The Holy Spirit will always guide you based upon the truth of this book. Not on what I consider to be the truth, but on what this book says. If the Lord keeps this ministry online, great. If He doesn't, I'm not going to have a heart attack because He didn't. If the Lord has led you to support another ministry, I'm not going to ever, ever criticize you for that. It is impossible to believe that in this fellowship, there is an absolute unanimous opinion as to which groups ought to be supported by our funds and our prayers and our activity and, and so on and so forth, and, and which should not. I believe what I should do is present the truth of this book and let you decide whether this is an organization that you want to work with and support. If you want to put all your efforts here, that's between you and the Lord. If you want to participate in any organization for a greater outreach, that's between you and the Lord. If you have a personal ministry of your own, that's between you and the Lord. I believe that it is my obligation, my responsibility to provide you an insight into this book so that you can make up your mind what you want to support and what you don't. And I believe it's 
unfair and unkind to accuse this ministry of taking a stand against any church, any ministry, any organization. I have not been called to tell you folks which ones are good and which ones are bad. I don't have the time, first of all, to study their doctrinal position, their attitudes, their, their, their approaches. I do believe, however, in a sovereign God who will deal in your life and He'll deal in mine. And I simply want you people to know that the purpose of this ministry is not to supply you with some list of organizations that BHF has branded as heretic, you know, as branded or labeled as, as ministers of Satan. Not my job, okay? I will not be publishing Stephen's Book of False Apostles on our website. You would have to listen to a lot of our videos before you heard me name people or organizations or talk bad about them, trash them. Uh, I'm, I've heard people talk about me being critical. I suppose I am. I, I am critical of what is taught, and I'd never suggest that there's great purity here that doesn't exist anyplace else. Not at all. I am simply saying that it seems to me the call of the Holy Spirit is for you and I to look at this book and then ask ourselves, is that the way we function? To the degree that we're wrong here, to the degree that we're right here, we're right to the degree that we're wrong, we're wrong, and that's true of any other organization. What I'm trying to say in, in too many words here is that we are not, unless we dramatically change our policy, we are not going to take a stand against, against any group of believers or professed believers. What we're going to do is take a stand on the truth of this book. That it's the inspired word of the sovereign God. That in your study of this book, the Holy Spirit will lead you to examine carefully what is taught, the methods used, the bait, the guile, the deceit, whatever it is. And to whatever extent that's true here, it's wrong. And whatever so-called criticisms come from this chair, I hope that they are based upon what the Word says and are directed as much toward myself as others against any other fellowship. Or, I suppose, I guess we could build a huge pole barn church somewhere out here in the, in the pasture someplace, some... Uh, if, you, if you want to, you know, with a restaurant in the arm of the cross, a, a prayer room at the foot of the cross, maybe put a, a kind of a parking garage under the church. Uh, we'll, we'll change your oil, we'll wash your car, we'll lube it while you're going to the morning service. You know, that way we could really make this thing into something. You know, we could do that. You know, we could give discounts to everybody that, that gives $100 or more a week, you know. If, if our purpose here is simply to reach people, we're, folks, we're doing it all wrong. If we really worked at it, I'm sure that we could be the biggest church in Oklahoma. You know, we'd, meet, we'd need a little bit of an investment, but hey, you know, there's a lot of money out there in the religious world. You know, we could have a swimming pool in the basement, a couple of enclosed tennis courts, two bowling lanes, you know, You'll get all the young people in the city. They can come and do those things free. And of course, you know, if you get the young people, you can get their parents, right? Right? You know, if you get the kids, you'll get the parents. That strategy wouldn't work here. Because I think our primary viewing base here are, are those probably over the age of 100. So I'm, I'm not sure. We're not trying to develop a huge organization, folks. With all of my heart, I want you folks to know what this book says. And in as much as the book is taught wrong here, it's, well, it's wrong. I will, however, violently argue that BHF is not managed by a minister of Satan. You, you may not know that, but I know that. I know that. 
because his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. You know, I may be very stupid. I may be very uh, a very stupid child of God. I may be very unfaithful with, with the Word, but I know I belong to Him. And my great concern, my, my primary concern, my Bible study every week, my prayer every day is that what will be provided here is an opportunity for all of us to dissect this book in truth so that we can decide whether that, that place, that person, that organization is worthy of our support and our time and our effort, or it's not. I do not believe it is my job to tell you which ones are good and, and which ones are bad. Now then, verse 15, ended, that their end shall be according to their works. And I think that is a marvelous verse. One I wanted to hover over for just a bit here. I suggested to you a week ago that we'd look uh, at that a little bit before we close the paragraph. It is absolutely fantastic, in my opinion, that our end will not be according to our works. Now, I want you to recognize when you read the 15th verse that, first of all, that's the popular theology. Not only among unbelievers, non-believers, children of the devil, that is the popular theology among Christians today. That our end is according to our works. It is not. It is not. All right? That's the popular opinion, even among Christians. You think you're going to heaven? Well, pastor, I, I think so. I hope so. I, I hope that when God weighs it all up, I'll go to heaven. You know, and even though we sing grace and we preach grace, somehow deep in the heart is, is the old vestige that somehow or other our eternal destiny is based upon us. Dearly beloved, that is the popular theme growing in so-called evangelical circles today, or at least otherwise fundamental circles today. So-called fundamental circles that eternal life is a cooperative effort between the individual and God. That what Christ did, of course, is supremely important, but, what, but one must add to that his own responsibility or he doesn't have eternal life. <clears throat> I have suggested, and I, and I insist on it in my own study, I've suggested time and time again here that I believe that there are two life streams that are pictured in the Word of God. One is the eternal life of our standing in Christ, and the other is the life of fellowship and communion, our walking, you might say, which may or may not be real, and, and it may in fact come and go. There may be times, folks, when you are in a deep spiritual, blissful, prayerful, communion with the Lord, and there may be other times when walking after the lust of the flesh, you are far from that. You're far from communion and fellowship with the Lord, knowing little of His peace and rest and joy that He purchased at such a great price for you. And so there is a turbulent life in the Word of God that has to do with my faithfulness, my willingness to assume responsibility. Well, Pastor, you, uh, you don't seem to emphasize too heavily our responsibility in all of this. Folks, I want to hear you tell me that after this video. Because that simply is not true. And I've never preached that. The, the question is where our responsibility lies. In looking at the relationship between a husband and his wife consistently in the, in the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is using that as an illustration of our relationship to Christ. To me, that is one of the supreme illustrations of how quick that the human mind can run amok. There are great seminars and conferences on Ephesians 5 that deal with the relationship between the husband and the wife. And when I say to these people, that's only incidental, I get in all kinds of trouble. 
You know, I'm talking about a verse that says, now, by the way, I have been speaking about Christ in the church. I haven't even been talking about a husband and a wife. But incidentally, by the way, as a passing thought, husbands ought to love their wives and wives ought to reverence their husbands. But the key premise, dearly beloved, the key emphasis of the passage is Christ and the church. But what have we done? We've made the key emphasis the marriage relationship and an incidental emphasis on Christ and the church. And to me, that's typical of how carnal the handling of the word is. In many, many cases, I sound as though I'm, I'm minimizing the practical and, and maximizing the spiritual. And if I sound that way, folks, I'm, I'm sort of glad because that's, that's what I'm doing. If the primary emphasis of a passage is that I should not commit immoral acts, then, then one can go to hell and never commit immoral acts. He can duplicate it. He can counterfeit it. He can fulfill the verse implicitly. But... If, first of all, its supreme emphasis is spiritual fornication or spiritual immorality, he can't duplicate it. And further, I have the silly preconceived idea that if you are spiritually fellowshipping with the Lord every day, that if your spiritual relationship is pure, I'm going to suggest, suggest to you people that the moral will follow. However, if you concentrate on the moral and you make it pure, the only thing that will follow is pride. And I believe that is extremely dangerous. And so every passage of Scripture, I look at, first of all, from the spiritual emphasis because that can't be faked. And when I fake the human emphasis, it always leads me to be proud. You know, well, you ought to be as good as I am. And man, I'm glad I don't do those things you do. Man, I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't do the other thing. I'm really pretty good. But if I take the spiritual emphasis, I'm suddenly devastated before the Lord. Now, it, it seems even among Christians today that in some way or to some degree, our end is going to be according to our works. In John 5, 29, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Marvel not at this, for the day comes and now is when all they who are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. As most of you probably know, that, that is a key verse in all of the New Testament. For you Greek students out there, marvel not at this, for the day comes and now is when all who are in the grave shall hear His voice. They that have completely done good unto the resurrection of life, those who have practiced evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Two distinctly different words there in the text that are translated with the same English word in the authorized version. The only person who has completely done good, dearly beloved, is Christ. The only person who, has, who completely does good is the new sinless nature. If nothing else, here is a simple statement from my Lord and Savior that the old nature is not going to go to the resurrection of life. That, that makes sense to me. Here is further a statement that the new nature has never, never, never done any evil. It has completely done good. And that's the new creation, the sinless new creation. That is, in fact, a creation filled with the Holy Spirit and given the will of God so that it does not have any will but God's will. And that's why in 1 John, I'm told that it cannot sin because it, it is born of God it cannot sin because it doesn't have the ability to do, to, to do so. 
So my relationship to God eternally has nothing to do with my works. But theirs do. And it seems to me in John, I have a key indication that the difference between receiving according to my works and not receiving according to my works is judgment. And in Romans chapter 8, I have the key announcement of the grand news, that glorious news, that fabulous news, that that, that gospel that we preach declares that there is no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 I praise God, dearly beloved, that my end is not according to my works, but Christ. That suddenly casts light in my mind on some passages which are tremendously precious to Christians. You know, you verses I'm sure you, many of you know. You, you got it in your soul winning kit, you know. Uh, For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. So my end has nothing to do with works. For we are His workmanship. My end has everything to do with His work. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Whose? Whose good works? Not mine. His good works. Which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. In what good works do I walk? The good works of Jesus Christ. My end is not according to my works. And folks, I believe this is fantastic. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we studied rewards. Many of you remember. We studied that accounting that we will all give before the tribunal of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a judgment, not a condemnation, but an accounting. And we found that it was according to effort. Kapos is the Greek word. Is, but not according to works. We saw that our reward was proportional to the endurance of our effort. If any man's work, singular, it, it wasn't works, plural. If any man's work, singular, is burned up. And, and, it, and it, uh, we're talking about, it's talking about the works that were built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. That was the basis of my reward, but my very presence at that tribunal was the workmanship of Jesus Christ. I am not suggesting that you should not be concerned about fellowship and communion. Of course you should. Dearly beloved, you will be. If there is any love for the Savior, if you do not love God, if you do not love Christ, there is... There is no constraint, no yearning, no longing, no drive to be in fellowship and communion with Him or with others. But if you recognize more and more what He's done for you, how much He's done, the greatness of His grace, there is an undercurrent of drive and desire to be pleasing to the One who bought you. That's the constraint I want. Not the constraint of the flesh, not the constraint of fear, but the constraint of love. For perfect love casts out fear. My end is according to His work. Their end is according to their works. And the difference, the tremendous, the exhilarating difference in the verse, I believe, is the finished work of Jesus Christ. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, thanks for watching.